Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Начинаем секцию исследования и аналитику. Инфраструктура, bandwidth, connectivity, security, reachability, all kinds of software, any of these dimensions requires its own research, or rather deserves its own research. And research of the domain industry is basically the same as research of the Internet. I think that a statement like this is not only bold, it's true. So let's talk about how we research the Internet. Let's get ahead with our presentations and our first about when things don't work the way we want, how can we use internet measurements to detect internet events? Okay, so we all have seen um, uh, a dreaded web page like this, especially when we are in the middle of something really important and, uh, and we have no internet connectivity. So what do we do? Usually the next uh, action is turning it off and on again. And surprisingly, this works sometimes, but other times, yeah, we still cannot get to our uh, uh, domain that we wanna access or we are still having service issues. Uh, so what could be the issues over here? It could be of various reasons. It could be personal outages. Uh, it could be uh, because of uh, uh, Wi-Fi coverage, it could be because of Wi-Fi, uh, you have no internet connection, device configuration issues, or outages at ISP levels, or technical failures, um, congestions. Um, sometimes uh, we have maintenances at our ISPs or hosting providers, routing issues, security breaches. It could be a number of things, right? And it could be not only um, the regional outages, but it could be a country level outage um, or issues over here. It could be technical failures. It could be a congestion, maintenance upgrades at the ISP level, or it could be a regional level problems. For example, countries can have an outage, uh, physical infrastructure damage, power failure, coups. We have seen political actions or technical failures. Uh, so usually we do have access to our personal equipment or things which are in our vicinity. However, the major issues are that we have no visibility outside our own uh, personal equipment. Um, and it's hard to figure out uh, what is happening in the upstream area. So today I want to talk about some of the publicly available data sets that you can use uh, to understand how things are happening and what things are happening around the internet to not only detect when these kind of outages happen, but also troubleshoot. So if we talk about internet measurements, we can divide it into two planes, a control plane, which basically sets the rule of the game. So it's the BGP data basically tells us how um, routing is happening and then what types of routing has been established. There are two publicly available data sets available or two uh, popular route collectors. One is RISC, which is uh, RIPE NCC uh, routing in, uh, route collector, and then there is route views. I'm gonna talk a bit more about RISC in a few minutes. And there, then there is also data plane uh, data sets, right? That you can do active and you can also look at the passive traffic flows. Examples of which we probably all have done in the past is using traceroute ping and DNS example. 
some of the examples of these publicly available data sets are RIPE Atlas. This is again a RIPE uh, MCC project. I'm gonna go in a bit more detail about it in a few minutes. Uh, there are also other data sets outside uh, RIPE MCC. One example for the DNS community is Open Intel Data. It's a, a project by University of Twente. And they are collaborating with a lot of TLDs, GTLDs, and um, they have a lot of DNS and they also do active probing. Uh, and uh, partially the data is open. Some of the data is not for public access, but if you reach out to them, they're very open for collaborations. Um, uh, there is also KDAS data set, and uh, they also do a lot of active probing. Uh, so tra trace out ping measurements and scan the internet. Um, and um, a lot of their data is also open. Some of the data is, is not publicly available, but they are also very open to collaborations. Um, and if you have some good use cases, you can reach out to them and they usually give access to their data. There is also a lot of other projects like MLab and others which provide you these kind of data sets. So I think um, there are these, these interesting data sets that one can use uh, for their use cases. Uh, so now moving on to RIS, that is Routing Information Service. Uh, routing Information Service uh, data set is basically BGP data. Uh, it started in 1999, and the, the great thing about the project is all historical data is publicly available. So uh, if you want to go back and see what happened when Pakistan, uh, for example, hijacked the IP space of YouTube, and YouTube had... Uh, uh, an outage worldwide, uh, you can go in RIPE MCC data and find out which uh, ASs were impacted because of this. So if there are even past events, you can always study how the impact happened, where it happened, and, uh, and in also like at what time, which AS got an impact. Uh, RIS is basically in majorly deployed uh, with the internet exchange points. As I said, it collects BGP data, uh, it stores uh, BGP messages and routing table dumps. It is also real time. So if you are witnessing a BGP hijack or something like that, uh, you can also see in the real time what is happening. Or if you did some misconfiguration, you can also see the impact uh, as it is happening and you can set alarms uh, as well. Uh, why do we collect uh, BGP data? Um, uh, it has... BGP, as we know, do not have a security mechanism and routing problems and, uh, and, uh, and are happening all the time. And looking glasses are temporary, so you can still use looking glasses, but this is like a historical looking glass that's always available for you to uh, diagnose, go deep down into how things are connected, where things are connected, um, how uh, peering is happening. In generally, it just gives you a better visibility, which is which brings greater security and low risk of BGP attacks or misconfigurations can be detected earlier. Um, as I said, risk is for network operators, network policymakers. It can help you uh, check for specific routes. Uh, you can look at the routing incidents. Uh, you can set up alarms. There's a lot of projects that have. Uh, built around risk and route use data that can give you alarms if something is wrong with your BGP uh, sessions or if you are announcing something you should not be announcing. So all kinds of these things or somebody else hijack your uh, prefix. Uh, you can set up these alarms and can detect events like this. And this is a safe haven for, uh, for researchers. There's lots of papers that look at, uh, for instance, uh, network disruptions, uh, at the CDN level, at an IXP level, and how things went out, uh, or service outages um, from the routing perspective. Um, so there's lots of papers uh, that also use RIS. Uh, the question how to access the RIS data, we have the raw data, which uh, is basically MRT files. If you go to risk.ripe.net, uh, you can basically see all kinds of information about how to download the data, what kind of tools are available to parse the data. Um, as I said, RISC also has RISC Live, uh, where you can just go to uh, RISC Live and give a prefix, and then you can see in the real time, uh, which is uh, uh, different peers, uh, how they see the announcements. Um, and there is also RIPSTAT through which you can look at different visualizations and also download the data. 
Uh, the second set uh, or second project that RIPE NCC has for active probing is RIPE Atlas data set. Uh, RIPE Atlas, uh, similar to RIS, um, is an internet measurement platform, but for active probing, we have been running this over a decade. So most of the measurements uh, on the RIPE Atlas are uh, public measurements. So you can also have access to historic data. Um, and RIPE Atlas users can create their own customized measurements as well. I'm gonna give some examples of what kinds of measurements and what kind of analysis you could do with using RIPE Atlas data sets. Um, it is more than 12,000 vantage points. And um, the, the core benefit over here is that, yeah, you can create a lot of measurements from your machine, but that's your own vantage points. But if you, for example, want to see how people from Latin America or Europe or Asia are reaching to your domain or your services, you can use RIPE Atlas to basically compare uh, from various parts of the world um, how things are connected to your, um, your services and is it good or bad. Um, we have also anchors. Uh, so anchors are creating also mesh between anchors so you can see between the anchors how things are moving and if there is an incident it gives a very stable point of view. Um, there are as I said, lots of historic measurements. Uh, it's collect collecting around 14,000 plus measurements per second, 33,000 measurements per day. So it's a lot of data. And you can always dig through the data to find uh, the interesting things in the data. Uh, so what can uh, uh, we do with RIPE Atlas measurements? So you can create for example, um, uh, uh, monitors for your vantage points uh, and see the reachability from different parts of the globe. If there are issues, you can always investigate uh, through to other vantage points. So if you are unable to reach a domain or a website from your network, you can always see if it's all, also having issues from other areas. So you can take another vantage point from your country, from your ISP or another country. Um, there are also ways to create alarms uh, using uh, status checks. Um, and yeah, you can do responsive as something as simple as IPv6 uh, connectivity. Uh, I would highly encourage if you are not uh, use Atlas to go to labs.ripe.net uh, and look at the case studies. There are tons and tons of um, uh, articles that people submit uh, there is a lot of crafty and interesting ways that people have created these measurements and used RIPE Atlas in the past. Uh, one example over here is, for example, um, uh, we have, uh, you can go to this link, observablehq.com, uh, um, and look at the latency. So here I've given um, a AS number of Ross Telecom, and as we know, Ross Telecom is very well peered. And uh, then from all different probes, uh, this basically tells the min RTT and all are green. So that means, yeah, if, you are, um, if your services are in Ross Telecom in Russia, you are very well connected to the rest of the world with very low RTT values. But you can try with other ASNs and um, uh, it's basically updated daily. And you can look at V4, V6, uh, uh, ICMP, TCP, and then you can see how the connectivity looks like. As I said, uh, yeah, maybe you have clients in Latin America and you wanted to see uh, the latency from Latin America to your services. And if you wanna improve it by moving to another ASN, for example. So now I wanna talk about a bit about what kind of analysis we can use when we use RIPE Atlas uh, data set. So here we did a study in 2021, uh, Manu from Meta um, uh, wrote on a mailing list that hosts in Mexico were not able to reach uh, WhatsApp.net. And interestingly, the problem was triggered by a route leak. So the traffic from uh, uh, Mexico was going towards a uh, K-Root server in China, and the middle boxes uh, somewhere in between the route were intercepting uh, the request and then uh, sending back a bogus reply. Um, so for WhatsApp.net, interestingly, the reply was for Twitter's uh, IP address at that time. And that outage lasted about a week. 
Um, and how did we detect this? So, you know, when you send the request to root server, it only replies with zone ref uh, referral. So it will never give us an authoritative reply. So using RIPE Atlas probe, uh, if you, uh, for instance, query over here, a probe in China to facebook.com, you get back an authoritative reply, um, which is on the left side. And if you look at the right side, that's the correct reply. It should give us the, the full zone, not an authoritative reply. Uh, uh, a root server would never uh, send an authoritative reply. So given that, we actually set up an experiment to see how uh, and where possibly there is a DNS root server manipulation happening. So we used all the RIPE Atlas probes. At that time, it was around 11,000 connected probes. And uh, we sent queries to all the root servers, A through M, for three domains um, to resolve for Facebook, uh, Google, and RIPE.net. RIPE.net, in this case, was our baseline. And we categorized responses into categories. So if we get um, uh, uh, a .com or .net uh, uh, TLD referral, then we would say, yeah, it's not intercepted. But if we got an authoritative answer, then we would say that, yeah, this there is a middle box that intercepted it, as I explained in the previous slide, that this should this cannot happen. A root server can never send an authoritative reply for a domain. So uh, with this experiment, we are we were able to see where, or at least close to which probes the interception was happening. And we saw for China in Iran, uh, the maximum number of interceptions. So again, it's very difficult to say where this middle box is, but just because the probes in China and Iran saw this uh, with a high frequency, then we have a little bit uh, of intuition that maybe the, the middle boxes are in China or Iran, and these countries are known also for a censorship. Um, in total, we saw around 4% of the probes uh, saw uh, uh, interception at some point in time, and around 20% of the probes saw interception for the duration of the study. Uh, rest, it was also like not all the time. A few times there would be an interception and the others it won't be. So this is one of the examples in which we can see actually um, how things are uh, when we look at the uh, RIPE Atlas data. Another great example I really like, this is an article again on labs.ripe.net uh, from Stefan. And he talked about DNS lies. Um, this, he took some of the uh, domains and he actually wanted to see uh, from the probes if there is DNS resolvers that block those domains. So in this case, for example, in China, he tried facebook.com. It's, uh, it's uh, because of the censorship, uh, the uh, domain is blocked in China. Uh, here you can see like really interesting bogus replies. None of these IP addresses all in red does not belong uh, to facebook.com. Then there are two other examples over here. And these two domains are uh, the, the one at the bottom is, uh, as far as I remember, was for um, uh, uh, music, pirated music and movies. And this is also blocked in France. Uh, but here you see uh, there is partial. So the one in the green is the actual IP addresses uh, for the domains. So even at the resolver level, we saw that for some resolvers, we do see that at uh, they're blocked. But for others, yeah, they, that um, uh, it does get the correct response. So a partial blocking or partial censorship is, uh, you can study those for domains that are interested to you and them, uh, are blocked in the country. So that was, I think, uh, that I also, uh, I think it's an important example of how the DNS community can use uh, resolvers for, uh, for finding these uh, interesting cases. Uh, final example I have, is from years ago, uh, my colleague Emil uh, did this analysis when the coup in Turkey happened. And uh, for some time uh, at 2130, when the coup uh, was going, in, uh, going on, uh, their SSL fetches failed. So you can also create SSL measurements at, uh, from right Atlas and people actually created these fetches. And then yeah, as soon as the things got to normalcy, then uh, it started to work again. But this also gives an example of when things don't work, it doesn't have to be a coup. 
But if, if a website is experiencing some issues, you can use SSL measurements to see if from certain countries, certain region, or certain ISP, if there is a probe, uh, there are any failures uh, for an SSL fetch. So these are just a few examples of how uh, Ripe Atlas has been used. There is also a lot of examples on, on how you can use BGP data for prefix hijacks, for uh, origin hijacks, and how uh, that can help you if there are problems for breachability. Um, in general, uh, you can study network uh, disruptions, ISP failures, or congestions using Ripe Atlas data. Uh, RIS also provides essential data for the control plane. Uh, Ripe Atlas data uh, gives you a data plane measurement, and I would encourage you guys to go to labs.ripe.net uh, for other case studies uh, to see how RIS and Atlas is being used. And also, if you guys have done something interesting, any interesting uh, measurements or case studies, please also submit your articles. We are very open. It doesn't have to be using Ripe Atlas or uh, RIS. It could be any other measurement, and there are a lot of interesting articles that community submit, and we have a very good readership. I would encourage you guys to submit an article. This is it for me, and I'm open for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kasim. And do we have any questions to the speaker? Uh, thank you so much for this great presentation. I have um, a question about uh, LS probe and DNSSEC support, because you talked a lot about DNS spoofing and uh, comparing data uh, against a root servers, you know, at the level of RIPE and uh, location of DNS servers, uh, this kind of comparison or coupling seems to be quite an interesting approach, but does it work with DNSSEC? That's my main question. And have you considered uh, other means, additional means to confirm DNS spoofing? Or um, yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, it can detect, but it can also be that, yeah, there are um, ISPs that are running their own resolvers and they uh, send an uh, authoritative answer, but this is yeah not an expected answer. And that's why something which you also observed uh, while doing the DNS root manipulation that some of the answers are correct. So if you are asking for Facebook or Google, you uh, get an authoritative answer, A or FATI record, uh, uh, but the records were, yeah, uh, the IP addresses were were for the for the domains. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting things were definitely when we got uh, a A or FATI reply, which do not belong to that domain, or at least, yeah, maybe they are running a cache or some other server, uh, and that can explain it, but. For the majority of the hosts, um, that's not uh, the IP address that we see. Um, and yeah, and then there is also mm -hmm. a local host in the reply that's yeah, not possible that uh, facebook.com has a 1.0.0.1 IP address. So there are some obvious cases where we can definitely see that this is uh, censorship. Or as I said, uh, the, the thing that started this investigation uh, uh, Thank you so much, Kasim. That was an interesting presentation. We hope to see you again at our subsequent events. Thank you. And our next speaker is Dmitry Kovalenko. This presentation will be much more applied or applicable. I don't know how to call that better. Uh, my name is Mildred Kovalenko. I'm with the MSK IX and I'm responsible for DNS projects. In my talk today, I will be discussing the assessment of availability of national domains or CCTLDs. I'm going to uh, refer to RIPE uh, Atlas, to the probes uh, that uh, Kasim described in his presentation. We used other tools as well in our research. We made a comparison between several tools. Let's get started. Uh, 
My presentation is split into two parts. Uh, first, that will be an introduction. The other part will be more um, applied. Like I said, uh, the CCTLDs, they are usually uh, like they're different from regular domains because they contain many points of delegation. They have references to other A records and other name servers if they are signed with DNSSEC. Uh, there will be a DS record. It, it, it usually, still, these have high DNS traffic, and uh, the SLAs are usually 100%. Availability is one of the key parameters. It should be 100% under the SLA. Uh, quantitatively speaking, in the data RU, uh, at the moment, we have more than five and a half million delegated domains um, within data ref. There are more than 740,000 domains delegated, according to stat.dom.ru. At the time I was preparing this presentation now, availability or SLA, you can measure it differently. Um, at the technology level, we're talking about physical availability of the equipment, uh, power, uh, availability of various physical components. At the higher level, there is software, data synchronization, um, configuration, uh, protocols, dependencies, um, extensions. And these levels, um, uh, these two levels probably do not have a major impact on availability, while network availability or reachability, the topology, has the greatest impact on the uh, subject matter of this presentation. Network availability, uh, it has several components. D the DNS protocol includes uh, replication features, several NS servers can be uh, declared authoritative that it's uh, that can be declared or announced in the authoritative uh, zone records and we can also use the unicast approach when behind one IP address there are several nodes hiding BGP helps us in identifying those cases uh, the topology or geography may be different uh, but uh, we announce a prefix uh, containing the NS server IP address, and by doing that, we ensure availability from various parts of the internet. And we measured this by the name server response time. And if we look at the main documents describing the DNS architecture, there is this old uh, RFC um, 882. It's more than 80 years old. And it's a mature protocol. Uh, and it says requirements to two and more servers. Then there is also a recommendation or guideline in RFC 2182. It recommends placing uh, them in different uh, geographies and uh, topologies of the network. In the new GTLD uh, specification 10, we find a response time requirements and the service uh, availability. A standard. So this uh, concludes with the introductory part of the presentation. Now let's turn to the research proper. We are interested in researching infrastructure servers uh, of the DNS uh, that are responsible for the data RU and data RF CCTLDs and how available they are in Russia. On the map, you can see several clouds the A, B, D, E, and F clouds. A is between Moscow and St. Petersburg. There's unicast between these uh, locations and the cloud B is spread out across the country. It's in the cities that have MSKIX infrastructure. And as part of BGP connectivity, they are announced at these internet exchanges. 
so the availability is local. If you look at any cast uh, in Russia, E, D, and F are showing notes that are announced from the same uh, geographical anthropological location in the Urals, in Siberia, and in the Far East. This is what we will research. And uh, now I'm going to show you the tools that we'll be using in our research. You know that the main customers for authoritative servers are recursive resolvers. The servers that um, identify the DNS hierarchy for the end users, and it's very interesting to see how the resolvers assess the availability of this infrastructure. There are different implementations of recursive resolvers, and usually the algorithms that they use is the closer, the better is the response time of the name server, the more queries will be uh, uh, hitting it uh, to get a reply. Besides, there are various systems of monitoring and debugging. Kasim mentioned RIPE Atlas in his talk. We um, uh, selected all the right probes located in Russia, and we also uh, used in data uh, probes located at trunk operators in Russia, in uh, uh, different Russian regions. This is what we've got at MSKIX. There we mostly use uh, open source software time-bound recursive uh, resolvers, and in its implementation, you'll find the so-called infracache that collects all statistics of uh, answers, it analyzes them. And one of its metrics is a round-trip timeout. It's the time period, the time interval that the resolver, resolver is willing to wait for a response from a name server. The smaller is the RTO, the better is the selected server, and the more queries will be sent to the server. The connectivity will be local if they are located close by, and, and the traffic will not have to travel across the country or go uh, beyond borders. We can see that the location matches the location of the servers of the recursive resolving uh, project. And interaction happens uh, within the framework of the selected logic. St. Petersburg goes to St. Petersburg or to Moscow. Moscow calls St. Petersburg or Moscow. And here, RTO is minimal. Rostov, Kazan, and Samara vary. They can call Moscow, St. Petersburg, or they um, travel locally at the local uh, internet exchanges. The same applies to Yekaterinburg, Novosibirsk, and Vladivostok. Here, the timeout is the best. It's the uh, lowest. Uh, uh, in the points where DNS nodes are located. This is the same data from in data probes. This is travel time when a DNS query is sent to name servers out of the probes located in uh, every region. Uh, at our trunk operators, and you can see that, at the best, the logic is repeated. Sometimes uh, the time of response is worse. And sometimes traffic can travel from Novosibirsk to Moscow and then back to Novosibirsk. These things also happen. We pay special attention to that case. And now we're looking for a different operator. 
to have an additional provider in the region to improve connectivity in Khabarovsk, for example, for example, the operator uh, went not to Moscow but to neighboring regions because there is peering between operators or between the operator and an RDNS network in a neighboring region, but in the forest, and no such peering interaction is available. Uh, these are RIPE Atlas probes. Let's see how NS service responded to the probes. Let's move from uh, east to west. The cloud is in the eastern part of the country, and you can see that most of the probes in that vicinity, uh, they have the lowest response time. And then closer to Urals, to the Urals, we see that the green uh, starts shifting next to Siberia, fewer probes, but this spot follows the topology and then in the forest and there are very few probes but still there are probes and there are clients uh, who make use of their local availability this is the b cloud this is what is distributed across all of the country and the uh, farther east the worse is the connectivity the response time is higher and basically it's the same situation as with trunk operators either there is no peering in the region or traffic travels well traffic travels to other regions to get the response from the dns server Uh, these are the takeaways. Traffic needs to be localized inside the region so that the users in the Far East and in Siberia would need to uh, travel to the Urals or to the central part of Russia. As to what you personally can do, you can connect to IX, and if you're already connected, then you can establish uh, appearing with our DNS network, and you can make uh, the CCTLD infrastructure service closer to your network. Thank you. Okay, excellent. The more peering, the better. We have time for just one question. Okay, Dmitry. You did this research. Uh, you saw the uh, drawbacks. Uh, do, do you plan to fine tune the system? Well, appearing is. Uh, double-sided. Not all operators uh, know that we are trying to improve uh, the operations, so we have to uh, um, contact the operator uh, and discuss the appearing policies. Uh, like in Novosibirsk, we had to change a local uh, operator uh, to improve coverage to complement the coverage of the users. Or, you know, we are writing to them and we are trying to enhance the operation of the network uh, to keep traffic inside the region. We received a question from our online viewers. But, uh, this question is uh, somewhat outside of uh, the discussed topic. It's a question about uh, root servers. 
I think the organizers of the conference will be able to answer this question uh, offline. Our next speaker is Anna Podguk. She's a, a new person, she's a new face at the conference. Anna is the graduate of the High School of Economics, and uh, this, this presentation is based on her thesis. And I also wanted to introduce to you Vail Hramsov, who acted as Anna's uh, mentor and uh, scientific advisor. Hello. I wanted to talk about the uh, measurement of um, public services usage um, with the help of DNS resolvers. We all know about the DNS system, domain name system. It converts domain names into IP addresses. And every device uh, online uses DNS. One of the key elements of the system is the DNS resolver. So it means that every device online uses DNS resolvers. The resolver may be uh, public, like Yandex or Google, or they can belong to providers. APNIC, the Internet Registry, uh, has a lab, and this APNIC lab produced a um, tool that measures DNS resolvers operation. It has lots of uh, pros. One of its cons, though, is the loss of data representation uh, for the Russian market. And because Google in March 2022 changed its policy of advertising and monetization of advertising, which is one of the key elements uh, uh, by uh, one of the um, uh, data collection tools. Uh, the data for Russia became uh, irrelevant, uh, but over here you can see the number of uh, measurements taken in March 2022. You can see a sharp decline, and then the data is basically not collected. So the question is, is uh, APNIC Labs statistics accurate? So, I wanted to reproduce an independent uh, measurement system that would be analogous to the APNIC Lab one, and then I wanted to compare the results of the system that I would develop with the APNIC data. This is how data is collected. We have a measurement script. It's uh, published on the platform. The end user sends the query to get the script. And as it is returned, a JavaScript is created to extract a random subdomain that are necessary to send queries to the uh, domain name server and the HTTP server. They will determine the IP of the resolver and of the user, and after that, they will match them. So as a result, we've got this measurement system and a web server with statistics. The web service is available uh, at the link shown on the slide, and statistics um, is represented in three dimensions, graphs, uh, diagrams, and tables. The web service uh, products or reports are shown on the slide now, but uh, right now you're looking at the findings. To the left, you can see the list of Russian autonomous system, or the main Russian autonomous systems with the largest number of IPv4 addresses. To the right, you can see a list of Russian ASs that we collected during our research. Well, it should have read, well, 
there was supposed to be red um, dots showing you the matched data, but you can see basically that the lists do match and the main autonomous systems are present in our research. Therefore, that means that uh, uh, the required coverage is also ensured. As to completeness of data, we keep gathering data and filling our database. We haven't yet reached the saturation point, but uh, right now there are about 1,200 uh, AASs in the database. According to IDDB, in Russia there are roughly 5,700 AASs. It means that we can uh, um, continue collecting the data or the, rather the sources of data, but we must also take into account the technical capabilities of the measurement system itself. So one of the main takeaways from this research is that the list of popular resolvers that are used in Russia is different from the list uh, that can be found at APNIC uh, Labs reports. We should start with the Google Resolver. It's in the first place according to APNIC, but uh, in our research it shows up on, in the fifth place. Cloudfairnet and Amazon are more popular international resolvers. And then there are also uh, domestic resolvers like Yandex. Yandex is in the first place and then SD as well. Unfortunately, we uh, we don't have any statistics on Yandex and NSD uh, in the APNIC Labs report, which is quite sad. As to the platforms on which our measurement script is uh, posted, it's Netoscope, uh, WebEvo, uh, Net Timing. Well, um, this is this is it from me, and uh, uh, I will be happy to take your questions. Well, you mentioned the platforms where you published your script. They are Netoscope resources. Um, what's what's the traffic there? I mean, what is the? I mean, can you use them to for your assessment? I understand it's not the Yandex search engine, but uh, how comparable are they? How often are these resources uh, addressed? The resources that you used. Oh, okay, Vadim, you can go to resolver.net.ru and it shows you how many measurements were taken. Yeah, exactly. On the first page, you can find statistics of all the key measurements that were shared in this presentation, the number of autonomous systems that we store in our database and the number of resol uh, resolvers that we um, detected. Is this it? No, no more questions? Thank you very much, Anna. And our next uh, speaker is Pavel Hramtsov. This is Netoscope. That's Olga. This is your Netoscope. And uh, this is what users in Russia see. Virtually all um, AS, Russian AS uh, admins, they uh, use Netoscope. I will be speaking on behalf of another student. Uh, probably you are familiar with Alexander Venedukin. He was this student's uh, mentor. Uh, this uh, was a student's project. Um, and uh, 
this this um, project uh, was implemented as part of cooperation with the Bauman Technical University. In data, uh, once uh, students uh, uh, master program students to dive into practical issues. In that, I want to give them an idea what they will have to do at work when they get employed. Because usually when students um, find employment, uh, they say, OK, where is your data? I'm going to uh, draw beautiful charts for you. But, well, in fact, you have to first collect the data. And this is hard work. Often it's manual work. Only like 3% of your job is drawing nice looking diagrams. Besides, 80% of your work will be wasted because as you proceed, you will realize that what you collected before either makes no sense or is garbage. So you have to be very critical of everything that you do. In this case, Alexander Vinidukin, uh, uh, during our uh, previous TLDCon in Petrozavodsk, he was um, talking about the Internet Protocol stack, TCP IP, or in a more academic manner, the open system connection. Well, this stack, uh, according to Alexander, has become more flat protocols intermingle. There is encapsulation of one protocol into another, into yet another. It's becoming complicated. It's no longer a linear scheme. And uh, these complicated structures need uh, to be visualized somehow. So this uh, project is dedicated to visualizing the uh, logic of internet services uh, basically uh, on the slide you can uh, on the slides, you can uh, read what I've just described in a more you know, simple, less academic way. So the idea was to build a visualization system that would be protocol independent. Uh, it shouldn't matter whether we are using HTTPS or DNS or DNSSEC or TLS on top of everything. We want to be able to visualize the uh, logic of uh, internet services regardless of what's inside. We wanted to visualize a protocol independent logic. Uh, now you're looking at screenshots of various ways to visualize protocols. To the left is the in data uh, visual, visualization uh, project for BGP connectivity. In the middle is something that everyone's familiar with. Uh, it's a tool that we use to. Uh, check on DNSSEC, DNSVs, and uh, to the right, it's a visualization system that is usually installed on local servers. This is HTTP as a visualization to validate certificates, TLS from the roof, root. Uh, it's different architecture altogether. In the DNS system, there is one root, a single root. Uh, wherever there are certification centers, you will see trees and forests. All of this needs to be represented somehow, and preferably uh, by using just one tool. This is the data that the student gathered as uh, he was working on the project. The data are listed here, DNS, uh, what, what is it, DNS, AVI, TLS. It, it was easier with TLS. A DNS over TLS is visible. It's something that we can see. So that was the main reason why uh, we settled on TLS. 
Because if you go uh, down uh, to, to encryption, yes, it may be uh, more practical, but uh, it's less educational because it's less visible. MXs are there. Well, you can see the list. The tools that the student used when a uh, um, uh, student gets a job, uh, the student must be familiar with a certain stack of tools. So uh, these are the tools that this uh, student employed. Now he can uh, write about that in his CV. It was the Bauman. It says here at the uh, Moscow Institute of uh, Electronics, but in fact, it was not that higher education institution, but it was the Bauman Technical University. Since the data, well, actually, uh, the system administrator is looking at the black screen and tries to find the data there. Here, the student was working with an intermediary scheme. The student was uh, extracting data from the utilities uh, that we use on the black screen. We look at that with our own eyes. This, um, but the um, result was displayed in JSON so that we would be able to work with any tool uh, that's, that was capable of processing JSON and represented graphically. And this was the idea to make visualization independent. So the data comes in uh, some general format that uh, can be uh, uh, processed uh, with the help of a converter, but it can be processed basically by any graphic tool. In fact, it's not just a visualization tool, right? Because we need this tool to identify anomalies. The wrong TLS certificate, invalid TLS certificate, DNSSEC that is twisted, or a DNS server. In the list doesn't have an IP address. Maybe it's lame delegation. Well, it's not really lame de delegation, but uh, something similar. Uh, mistakes, typos, defects that can uh, cause uh, deficiencies or even incidents, and they should be displayed somehow on the uh, visuals. Here we are discussing a domain uh, that contains lots of various deficiencies or defects. The red one there is no DNS record, uh, the yellow different analysis with, from different authoritative servers, and orange something wrong with MXs. So this is the um, address record. These are different analysis. <laughs> well, it's easy for me to look at the big screen. Uh, my eyesight is poor. I prefer big screens. And this is um, how you can uh, turn it around. Here, the information is representative in a linear mode, and over here, the same information is shown in a circular diagram. All people are different. Some prefer tables, others prefer graphs, yet others prefer circular diagrams, pictures. I think that uh, mostly people are familiar with MaxMind and other uh, similar tools, and you know that uh, the visuals come in different shapes and sizes. So there is a domain that supports DOT, DNS over TLS, like wikimedia.org. On one of the green uh, boxes, in one of the green boxes, uh, that's exactly the information that you'll be able to find. These are the findings. IPv6 is not there. 
we didn't touch IPv6. We didn't ask the student actually to uh, touch the IPv6, only Quad A records from the zones. So at a later stage, either with this student or with another student, we want to uh, pursue this uh, project further. And we use Graphis, the standard library, to visualize the box the squares, the JSON, it can handle the J JSON files. Uh, that's it. Uh, it can be shared as a utility. Or you can have a website uh, to display the results. But the website is not ready yet. It will be some other student's project. Oh, and the students are totally wonderful. I've been working with them for the past 40 years. No, the students aren't getting worse. That's for sure. They are getting better. Colleagues, any further questions to Pavel? Uh, Pavel, we hope that the organizers of this event will invite you again, together with the students, uh, to share the projects with the audience. And now in next... Um, speaker is at the Funk Fest. Well, um, I've been making presentations at this event uh, on the Rune at economics for the past several years, and I think that uh, this data is useful because we all need to understand which way Rune at is uh, evolving. The data and the forecast that we make at our association every year, I think, are are um, really necessary uh, for everyone to understand where RUNET is uh, going to. See, we celebrated 30 years of the RUNET. Next slide, please. Economic uh, RUNET, we measure по разным направлениям. There are different ways to measure the RUNET uh, economy. There is a so called digital a counter, and we measure marketing and advertising, infrastructure and telecom, e-commerce, which plays the key role, and of course, uh, digital content. Next slide. I'll have to run through the slides, sorry. This number, and uh, probably colleagues who have been attending the conferences in Russia, uh, they are very familiar with this figure, but since this is an international conference, I just wanted to highlight that the volume of Runa economy at the end of 2023 amounted to 17 trillion and 100 uh, billion rubles, which is plus 40% on 2022. Uh, you remember that analysts came out with different forecasts, and I mean analysts both uh, domestic and uh, international, that the internet economy will uh, sag without other services, nothing is possible, but in fact, what we observe is growth, and the growth at an unprecedented rate, uh, something that has not been seen uh, in the earlier years. Uh, we've been taking the measurements since 2011, we have a long database. In 2014, uh, we saw a growth rate of almost 50% on the early years in 2021, 2022. Uh, there was a substantial growth due to e-commerce in our country. In uh, 2023, it showed that, yes, e-commerce is growing too, but other uh, areas such as cybersecurity, digital content, infrastructure, and telecom, they are also gaining momentum in uh, the government and uh, businesses invest a lot of resources into the development of these industries. Now let's turn to the internet audience. 
85% of the Russian population are internet users, which means more than 100 million people. And of course, out of these internet users, virtually all of them use uh, internet on a daily basis. There are several countries that have almost 100% of internet penetration, Switzerland, Denmark, um, Ireland, and uh, several other countries, but I'm sure that uh, Russia and Belarus will join uh, that uh, list uh, within the next several years. Well, at least this is the aspiration. Uh, we uh, are aspiring to almost 100% uh, penetration. As a matter of fact, in 2025, serious uh, change is uh, coming uh, in Russia in terms of support of various uh, digital projects. Uh, there is a big event going on right now in Vladivostok, the Far Eastern Economic Forum. Mr. Grigorianko is responsible today in the government for the development of uh, digital economy and information technologies and data economy. And he made a presentation. He unpacked the uh, lines of work that in 2025 will be included into the national uh, program, data economy. And out of the main lines of work, uh, what we find is information security, uh, internet development, new telecom services, 5G, and education, staff. Uh, we'll see uh, how our association and business will be involved uh, in the execution of this uh, government initiative, but the trend is um, for greater participation involvement of the government in the internet industry and the businesses operating in Russia today have many joint projects with the government. It's one of the trends that is uh, widely discussed and I believe that it will become more and more uh, manifested, not just in Russia, but in other countries as well. Unfortunately, I'm not present at the conference in person, but I can see that the uh, there is this uh, trend. The government and the businesses begin to cooperate more closely in uh, various digital initiatives. I believe that it's something unavoidable, and those who are, uh, I mean, the businesses who are resisting this trend today uh, are bound to lose. I think that uh, this, this is um, this is a given, it's a fact uh, of today. Next slide, please. Now let's uh, take a look at these dimensions one by one. Marketing and advertising at the end of 2023, we uh, saw an increase of 45% uh, on 2022, and this industry made 564 billion rubles. Next slide, and one more, and yet another one, finance and trade, or commerce. I'd say that the overall volume of internet economy in 2023 amounted to 17.1 trillion uh, rubles, but you can see that almost 16 trillion out of that is the segment of e-commerce. Which is not uh, good news, in my opinion, because we are too dependent on just one segment. Basically, all of the internet economy is dependent on this segment. If something happens with the largest uh, marketplaces in Russia, the whole uh, sector of internet economy may decline. And on the next slide, you will see that uh, online retail and online finance, uh, their share is uh, the heaviest, is the greatest. And maybe in 2024 or 2025, uh, the law will be adopted in Russian on marketplaces. We don't understand which way regulation will go, or whether it will be incentivizing or will be protecting, uh, protective, or it will be compensatory. We do not understand yet uh, how this uh, regulation will be shaped, but the marketplaces together with associations are cooperating with uh, the legislators 
make sure that the draft law currently developed in the state Duma would be aligned with the interests of the business and of the end users. We'll see what comes out of it. Uh, next slide, please, and one more. Everyone uh, forecasted that when Western majors would leave Russia, digital content would um, uh, sag dramatically. Last year at TLT Khan, I was saying that, of course, the segment of digital content uh, then at the end of 2022 um, fell uh, substantially, but we can see the numbers today. Uh, the growth is almost uh, 100%, and uh, the current uh, volume of this segment of digital content is 186 billion rubles. And I would like to thank the Institute of Internet Development. Our association was uh, uh, one of the initiators of this institute. Actually, uh, last year, this year, billions of rubles were allocated to uh, develop digital content. We can see that it played a positive role in uh, making sure that EV, OCO, and other uh, online movie theaters uh, offer so much exciting, interesting, entertaining in educational uh, documentary digital content. Next slide. And one more. And one more. As to infrastructure and telecom, we are gaining uh, much compared to previous years. Next slide. The domain market is not growing very much, while the host and the hosting market is not uh, growing uh, dynamically either. But uh, cloud hosting infrastructure and several other technologies, SaaS, for instance, are also uh, well are, are doing great. Uh, it will be very difficult to live in the future without the clouds. After different social media left and when micro businesses lost the platforms uh, that they used to sell uh, the goods and services we can see that uh, at the end of 2023 the domain industry actually uh, grew uh, there's more and more trust to the domains and i think that um, this trend will persist wanted to thank the uh, ctld.ru every year you help uh, and you su support uh, .rf, .ru and .su and every year you uh, contribute to the development of the market, you spare no effort uh, to keep uh, to, to keep uh, the domain area um, uh, alive and kicking. Uh, uh, the uh, industry is uh, it seems to be uh, sustainable. Uh, next slide, next slide. And I would like to to thank you for it. Uh, hosting providers, uh, we are looking at more and more hosting providers. Next slide, cybersecurity. It's one of the uh, leading uh, topics. Did those attacks continue? It feels like the uh, digital literacy in the country is improving, but at the end of 2023, the index of digital literacy in the country um, went down on average, not because the users are getting dumber, but because the fraudsters uh, that uh, operate online devise new schemes, they devise spyware and uh, similar tools there are more phishing domains and the spyware um, uh, is also um, evolving. So we need to do a better job of raising 
raising awareness of the users and educating the companies on how to protect themselves from personal data leakages and data leakages in general. The uh, less users face problems, the more they trust the internet, the more users there are, and the uh, bigger the runet economy becomes. Next slide, education and staff or HR. I'm smiling because uh, during the past 15 years, we keep saying that we don't have enough people in the IT industry. And every year, at every conference, we keep repeating that, uh, frankly speaking, I have no idea what should happen for us to stop talking about uh, the deficit, the shortage of IT personnel. We don't have enough middle managers. We don't have uh, enough uh, senior managers. Well, juniors, uh, we are more or less uh, self-sufficient in juniors, uh, thanks to Skillbox and Mythology, but Sberry, Yandex, VK, uh, junior, uh, juniors have been replaced by artificial intelligence. Yeah, we still do not have enough middle and senior managers or IT specialists. Next slide, next slide. Uh, right, digital literacy, I talked about that already. For uh, 6.46 out of 10 uh, at the end of 20, uh, 20, uh, work in 2023, between the 10th and the uh, 28th of October, we'll be organizing a series of events called the Digital Dictation. We will be asking people about phishing and uh, fraud online. Uh, our uh, analysts will be preparing questions. We'll try to use these questions to educate users uh, how to not face uh, problems online. One more slide, please. It's the final one. It's the number that we do not share very often, but uh, we can talk about it now. At the end of 2023, we expect Runa to grow by about 20, uh, 40%. The the economy will reach almost 24 trillion rubles at the end of 2024. Uh, this is considerable growth that will be caused not by digital content, not by digital security and infrastructure. It will be driven uh, mainly by the fact that Russian companies will start implementing uh, import substituted services that uh, they developed in 22 and 23. We are waiting. We are expecting good numbers at the end of 2024. And I'm very happy that the RUNAT economy uh, did not decline, it's developing. And I'm sure that uh, Russia will be proud of the advanced technology. One quick question, can I have why, why didn't I, why didn't I come? Well, almost. And the networking component is uh, critical for every conference, including TLD.com. But uh, since we have already talked about the artificial intelligence at other sessions, uh, Artificial intelligence for the data economy, uh, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Is it as an, an assistant? or a barrier, or it depends on the regulation. Yeah, thanks. Regulation of AI is very much on the agenda. But actually, at every conference, I keep saying that to uh, regulate uh, AI at the country level is totally useless. So either I'm say or um, oh, I'm sorry, I, uh, ITU or um, the United Nations, we should uh, uh, have uh, uh, we should have um, a broad discussion of uh, AI uh, regulation. As to AI in the economy, according to different forecasts, uh, projections. Uh, artificial intelligence will be adding uh, 15 to 20 percent uh, to the rule net economy every year. Um, Sergey, in your talk, you mentioned that the Russian Association of Electronic Communications is involved in legislation one way or another. Are your documents open? I mean, are they public? 
Yes, absolutely. At RAIC.ru, you can uh, monitor the information. We've got uh, several sections on the website, like information. Uh, there is also a GR club. It's close to one uh, inside the association. And uh, we discuss things that potentially can emerge as new draft laws and initiatives. Thank you very much. Any other questions to the speaker? Sergey, thank you. Thanks for being with us. That was a wonderful presentation. At least I uh, found many of your numbers uh, to be surprising. I want you to thank all our uh, presenters, and um, I'll see you next year. And thanks to the audience for your warm welcome.